Hello everybody, welcome. My name is Richard Simons and this is a Tesla Model Y. They've been in the UK for two years now and we're seeing plenty of these on the used car market and they are a brilliant electric family car. So in this video, I'm going to give you a bit of a buyer's guide. What to look out for, what are the common problems, what are the plus points, how much do they cost to run and what to look out for if you're buying a used Tesla Model Y. And it's raining outside so I've come inside, I don't want to ruin my hair, so let's use this car from our showroom as the basis of a demonstration. Now before we get too far into things, including what's good, what's bad, what to look look out for on the running costs, let's talk about the three versions you're going to find in the UK. Firstly, the standard range, the cheapest one. Standard range is rear wheel drive, there's a motor between the back wheels and it has a battery which is about 60 kilowatt hours gross, but it isn't LFP batteries, a different chemistry to a lot of other electric cars, including the dual motor and the performance ones. And the main thing about the LFP battery is you can charge it to 100% on a daily basis, whereas the dual motor and the performance ones, they don't. They like 80% on a daily basis and only go into 100% when you actually need that extra bit of range you're doing a long trip the next day, for example. So standard range like this looks much the same as a dual motor long range, which is the next in the lineup. Now that one, as the name suggests, has two motors, but the one between the front, one between the back, and the bigger battery. So that's got about a 79 kilowatt hour gross battery, about 74, 75 usable. And that car there is notably quicker than this car. It's got two motors to power it forward, but it is a little bit less efficient. Then you've got the performance model, much the same as a dual motor long range, but actually just dialed up to 11, really fast, 0 to 16, not much over three seconds, and it even includes track mode. Has there been revisions over the years? Not really, they've only been in the UK two years now, just over two years as we record this in March 2024. And uh, they've been much the same, really. The only slight revision was uh, there's a couple of things, really, that you're going to notice. Some cars don't have parking sensors. This one doesn't. The one that was at the front there does. You'll find a mixture. So in late 2022, about the age of this car, it's also a late 2022 car at the front. That's got parking sensors. This one doesn't. Now, initially, there was quite a lot of kind of concern about removal of parking sensors. It uses a thing called Tesla Vision, which is a camera to visualize objects. And initially, at least, it wasn't very good. It was a bit flaky. It was a disadvantage to have a car that didn't have parking sensors. Now, however, since then, of course, with Tesla, you get continuous software updates, and that includes these cars. And now Tesla Vision is actually quite good. We've done some videos on Tesla Vision before, and uh, actually it is pretty good now. So if you're considering a car with, or do I need to have the parking sensors? Do I go for the early car? I would actually say it doesn't really matter. Tesla Vision actually now, so even without parking sensors, is pretty good. The other thing you're going to find is that in 2023, and I tend to find that they're cars that arrive from about May, June 2023, they claim to have a comfort suspension because one of the Achilles heels of the Model Y has always been that, although it handles really nicely and sharp, it really is a fast car with sharp handling, the ride has been its compromise because of that. So they do ride quite firmly. Now this revision of suspension in 2023, if I'm honest, you have trouble to tell the difference between them. You can just about, but it's not night and day difference. It's not suddenly a soft, floaty, wafty car. They're all fairly firm. So is that a priority? Well, it would help a little bit, but there really isn't a great deal of difference. It's not night and day. So, and even we, we drive them day in, day out, have trouble telling the difference. There are promises of a better ride comfort with the next version of the Model Y. So what we will see maybe at the end of this year, maybe in 2025, no one really knows, but there's a revision called, uh, well, it's being called the Juniper. And that's much like the Model 3 Highland, like we see over here, the revised version of the Model 3, which mainly focused on improvements in refinement. And one of the key aspects with that was ride comfort. The new Model 3 Highland indeed does ride much nicer than the earlier Model 3s. Still not exactly a wafty car, but it's just quite comfortable. It's quite reasonable. It's a bit quieter. So I am looking forward to seeing those revisions on the Model Y. Uh, but they're not here yet. All the ones in the used car market are going to be basically much the same. And uh, we probably won't see that revision until later on in 2024. And that's the best estimate at the moment. But in the meantime, what we've seen so far hasn't changed a great deal. The one thing that's quite interesting with Model Y is that they do come with a high spec, even a standard range one like this. So even this has double glazed windows, front and rear, double laminated windows, dual phone chargers, your phone is the key, dog mode, sentry mode. All these cameras also act as dash cam. 
Uh, it even has premium audio and uh, high filtration, HEPA, uh, bioweapon defense mode, cabin filter, standard range, long range performance, doesn't matter, all the same in that regards. The seats are exactly the same, again, between a standard range and performance. So when you just look at them, there isn't a great deal of difference. But what it does mean is even the standard range has got a really good specification to them. One of my favorite and most practical features of the Model Y, which is quite unique to the Tesla, no other manufacturer does this, is a thing called dog mode. So in here, I can put it in dog mode, then when we close the doors, it leaves the air condition or the heating running with a message to passers-by not to smash the windows in because the dog is absolutely fine. So you may well be looking at one of these because you've got the practical needs. You can't have a Model 3, but you need a Model Y for your pet. And this is just such a great feature that I use personally quite regularly and marks the tester out from the others. It really is very useful if you have a dog. Apart from the badge on the back, the only real clue that this car here is a standard range is that it just has a black panel here instead of fog lights. The long range and performance ones have fog lights like this. There's only a couple of wheel variations between the models. Now, the performance one have a 21 inch Uber turbine as standard, but the long range and standard range will have wheels that usually look a bit like this. Now you can choose if you want to just take this aero cover off and you've got quite a good alloy wheel behind it here. So this is a 19 inch wheel and from the Tesla store you can actually buy a center cap kit and it covers the nuts up as well. And actually that looks quite good just as an alloy wheel. Maybe you don't want silver, gray, black. We've seen them before where they've been ch color changed and they look quite good. Now one thing you have to look for in a used car of course is just curb damage around the wheel. Put that back on like that, it's quick as easy. So you do sometimes see some curb damage around the edge here. Uh, it doesn't actually normally affect the center cap too much. It's normally just a very outer rim of the wheel, which is quite an easy and cheap repair to do. What is a little bit more difficult are the repair on the 20 inch wheel upgrade. So they look like this, and voila, a long range with a 20 inch wheel upgrade. Now this is quite popular in the used market to have these bigger wheels. When you have the 19 inch, you have Hankook tires as standard. These 20s have Michelin Pilot Sport EV tires. Now these are the ones that are a little bit more prone to curbing around the side or damage to the rim protectors here. So when these get curb damaged, you have to do a bit more to refurbish them. Not too hard to do, but you're probably going to be limited to how many times you can really refurbish them in the day. So just look after your wheels. If you've got the big 20 inch wheels, look after them because they look really good. Is there a difference in range between these and the 19 inch? Yeah, yes, a little bit. Uh, it's hard to quantify exactly, but we're looking at a, a little bit of difference in, in efficiency, and therefore that translates to range, but it's not vastly different. Is the ride much worse on these? I wouldn't particularly say so, to be honest. Although this is a bigger wheel with a thinner tire sidewall, there isn't too much notable difference, I wouldn't say, between them. Yes, I guess a little bit more fidgety, but it's not like the 19 inch wheel is a soft, comfortable ride and this is a firm ride. The rule, a firm ride. You will find a couple of differences here. Now this is an example with the parcel shelf and it folds away like that or you can just remove it all. It's actually just held with little magnets and you can just take the whole thing out. But it's a little bit fiddly to do. Now, the reason I did this was because some of the early cars, really for the first couple of months, uh, won't have parcel shelves. So if you see a car that doesn't have these ridges here, doesn't have a parcel shelf, that's quite normal. It just means it's one of the first batch in the UK. Didn't take too long before they started fitting these parcel shelves. Is it better to have a parcel shelf? I'm actually not too bothered. I think I find this a little bit clumsy and awkward, if I'm honest. And to be fair, it's maybe better to secure a load in, in the back. But in terms of sort of security, you can't really see through here anyway because the back windows on a Model Y are tinted as standard. And if I look like this now, I can't really see in that boot. Now, is the parcel shelf better for securing a load if you have an accident? Well, yes in theory, but this is just a magnet thing and you can see that it wouldn't be too hard for, I give up things to come out through there. What the Model Y is excellent for is storage space. So come around this way a little bit and you'll see that you've got a great big boot here, nice and deep, nice easy load area. There's a ton of storage underneath the floor here. There's a ton of more storage underneath there. And it's really easy to fold the seats. You can see they're in three sections, but you've got the two buttons here to fold those down, making for a really good load area like that.
One of the reasons the Model Y makes a brilliant family car is the space in the back here. It's much more comfortable than a Model 3 for taller passengers. So you've got mainly a good distance between the seat base and the floor. So I can sit here quite comfortably. In fact, I can put my feet right under that seat in front. So I'm six foot tall and I can stretch out happily in here. Loads of headroom and the seat is a good width. So you can get car seats or three people in the back here. The seats are actually slightly recline adjustable so they can be reclined like that or a bit more upright like that allowing for different space in the boot or how you want to sit. You've got a centre armrest compartment here. And like I said, this centre section can fold down separately to put a through load, which is very good. So the one thing you just got to look out for when you're looking at a used car is just how the seats have been used. What we have seen is that these are really durable seats. Now they could be white or black. They are very durable, they last well, but you do want to look out for uh, damage to the seat from car seats. So it's common that people put car seats in these. They do have Isofix as well. But if it's a sort of car seat where it has a sort of sharp dimples on the bottom, you can create a couple of creases in the back seat of this. Not the fault of the Tesla Model Y at all. It happens on any car. We see it on loads. And in fact, I would go so far to saying because this isn't leather, it's a sort of fake leather material, it actually has more elasticity than leather does. So we'll see some quite damaged rear leather seats on other cars. But the Model Y normally holds up pretty well to family use in the back here but just check that you don't have any seat marks or tears uh, across it here. We did have one car that had a little tear somewhere, I think it was here, and actually the cost to replace this seat cover here was actually very reasonable from Tesla. Uh, off the top of my mind, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think it was about 300 pounds, which if you've got a damaged seat cover, actually isn't too bad in the scheme of things. I don't think you get that from many manufacturers. So a good durable interior, really practical for family and kids, and of course, luggage and load space. So it's good, it lasts well, shouldn't have too many problems in here. The only thing we have found is sometimes you get seat rattles here, so you just gotta check for any movement in the seats. Um, but generally they're very good. So I'm done on my hands and knees here because there is a bit of a silly design for with the air vent for the rear seat passenger's feet. When you drive a car, uh, the Model Y, if you hear a rattling noise, if you turn left or right, accelerate or brake, it's probably a stone, a coin, a marble, kid's toy that's gone down this air vent here because you can see here, it's just an open air vent. So things very easily get down in there and then they rattle around in the ducting underneath the, the front compartment. Uh, so in here, stuff just simply rolls in and disappears. And it's a bit of a pain to get anything in there out. Uh, you can get aftermarket accessories, which is a little mesh panel that goes across the front of these. And I think that's a nice, simple solution to it. But if you can hear something rattling around, this is probably what it is. And it's a pain to get out. These uh, on each side are linked together. So some say you can park on a steep incline, it might come out. Some say blow air in one side, it might force something through to the other side. Uh, my colleague Gintz behind the camera there managed to get some stones out from one the other day by sort of persisting with fl flicking this up and down like that and eventually they came out and with a final burst of acceleration another stone came out as well. In fact even as I'm doing this now you'll see bits of dust and stuff coming out of there. So a bit annoying, can be resolved. If you hear something sliding around, well, that's probably it. All the Model Y interiors are going to look like this, no matter which version you choose. The only two differences really are whether you've got the white interior or the black interior like this one. Now, because this has the black interior, we have this wooden section of dashboard that goes across the doors as well. Some people may like it. If I'm honest, I'm not a fan. A lot of the feedback we get is that they don't, people don't particularly like it. I don't think it suits the car particularly well. Now, one thing that's very popular is we sell an Alcantara dash uh, replacement. So we remove this wood here, it gets covered in an Alcantara material, which actually matches this finish in the door cards and this finish here for the dual phone chargers. That's popular. If you've got the white interior, then you have a white strip across here. And that's really the only differences, the only two options you've got with the Model Y. Should you be scared of the white interior? I wouldn't worry too much. We've never had a problem. We've never found that the white interior looks shabby or dirty. It does clean up really well. The black seats get dirty. They clean up really well. And they do prove to be very durable. And if you have a look at this clip here, this is the driver's seat from one of our own Model 3s, which has the same seats as this. And this Model 3 here has covered 103,000 miles and the seat is still absolutely fine. There's tons of storage in this center console. It really is very good. And one of the great things that's just underestimated is that you've got a wireless phone charger there for the driver and a wireless phone charger there for the passenger. It's common sense, it's simple, it works, and yet 
not many cars have two wireless phone chargers and it baffles me because it's just brilliant. It just makes all the sense in the world. And when I drive a car that doesn't have this, I really notice it because you kind of have to sometimes even put phone chargers in here. It's just a faff. With the Tesla Model Y, your phone is the key. So you just tend to get in the car, you just put your phone on there, it charges. And then I actually don't normally need to charge at home either. And my commute is enough to top up my phone. So when I don't drive a Model Y, I always have to go and find my charging cable and then remember to plug it in at night and charge my phone up. So something I really miss is just the simplicity of that. And it sounds like a little thing, but it's true. The other little thing that's uh, notable with the Model Y is they've all got the same single screen in the middle here, which some people find is a bit odd when they've not been in a Tesla before. One screen here, no speedo here. There's no head-up display option, sorry. Uh, but your speed is right here, and honestly, I've never found it an issue. And this screen is just a lovely piece of software to use. It's super simple. Again, a popular little modification that we offer here, but it's widely available, is you can change the mount for this screen, so this screen can pivot towards you and tilt up and down a little bit. That's very popular to have. And if you're missing the idea of a speedo in front of you, you can get a little speedo readout that you can, uh, again, a little modification you put into the dashboard here, shows you your speed while you're driving. There is no head-up display option. I know a lot of people would like a head-up display option, but it's never been a possibility with Tesla. Again, there's a couple of kits, but I don't particularly like them. I also don't particularly like, I've seen some dashboard kits here. Now, some people like them, some don't. Me personally, I'm not bothered. I'm absolutely fine with the speed there, but there are various options available. So if the idea of not having the speed right in front of you here uh, is, is an issue, then there are options to work around that. Again, durability, longevity seems great with these. The steering wheel has been in the Model 3 for a lot longer, a lot more miles. And again, our car of over 100,000 miles, the steering wheel still looks basically as good as new. I have seen a couple of times with the Model 3, yet to see it on the Model Y, is potential for the sort of top layer of material on the steering wheel here to just flake a little bit, typically in here where a thumb might be. I've seen that on some cars, even with slightly lower miles, and then cars with higher miles have been fine. So it probably just depends how people hold the steering wheel or what hand cream they use or something like that. But as a used car, potentially just, just have a check around the steering wheel here that it hasn't got any scratches from rings and flaking. But normally everything in here is super durable. The one thing as I sit here that I'm reminded of to check is a thing called a seat pad sensor. So in the base of the seat here, there's a sensor and that sensor just knows when I'm in and out of the car. In fact, allegedly it even measures my weight so it knows how to deploy the airbags in the event of a crash. Um, anyway, uh, <laughs> quite, quite heavy. Um, but this seat pad sensor, uh, I've seen fail a couple of times on the Model 3 and I've seen once on the Model Y. So it's not a common thing. That pad sensor under this cushion here is nine pounds from Tesla. And it is something you can actually change yourself. Uh, it's a bit of a fiddle because you have to take this layer off and stuff like that. We have done it. Um, but even Tesla don't charge too much. And actually, the cars usually will be covered under warranty still, and that would be something that's covered. It sounds like a little thing, but it's quite important because that's how the car knows you've got out and it shuts the screen down and stuff like that. So if you find you get in and out of the car and the screen doesn't shut down when you close the door, like this, in fact, you've got to close your door there, Gins. the screen should go off exactly like that. If that stays on, it's going to be a 40 seat pad sensor, which does need changing. One thing that adds to the practicality of the Model Y is the front storage space. There's quite a generous amount of space in here where you might keep some cables or go in a way bag or something like that. It's just a plastic tub. And to be fair, what I found it most useful for is either camping trips, put some beers in there, a bit of ice, keep it cool. Uh, but actually more commonly some muddy wellies. You pop your wellies off, put them in there, and you can always just jet wash this out, leave this open to dry out. And so it doesn't matter too much if it gets sandy or muddy. So that really helps with practicality. And you don't see that on, or certainly not the size of this, on a lot of cars. I mean, you pick something like a VW ID4, You've got quite a big bonnet space, but there's no storage under there. So the Model Y, again, to score some points for that really nice practical space under there. Let's talk about paint colors. So this is white. White's a standard color. It's a pearlescent white, and it actually looks quite good. But you do see a lot more white Model Ys because it's a standard color. You have to pay money to have other colors. There's only gray, blue, red, it's even more expensive, or black. Now, black is the color that's hardest to maintain. It will show stone chips more, it will swirl, you've got to wash it carefully, you've got to look after it, and it shows the dirt really quickly. I think they look great in black. I like a black one, but it just needs a bit more maintenance. White ones like this 
I like to buy because white cars are really good at not showing any kind of swell marks or anything. I mean, this car here has got just over 30,000 miles and it looks great. It looks absolutely fresh and lovely. There's a couple of tiny little tiny stone chips there, but it's really durable. So white is a good practical color. The durability of it's really good. For me as a dealer, it's much easier in terms of you don't have to do all the machine polishing and prep work and uh, like you do with, with the darker color cars. So the white is the easiest and most practical color, but it's the most common and it does make them a bit cheap on the used market actually typically, whereas uh, a black or gray or red would be a little bit more expensive. Not by much, but just that little bit, but then they're more expensive new as well. The one thing to bear in mind with the red, lovely though it is, is that that's the one color that's a bit harder to do any paint repairs on. So if you get a little graze in a bumper corner here, I could just have a little smart repair done on this car. If it's red, however, it typically has to go through a body shop because it's a multi-layer paint and it's blending out because red's a harder color to match and blend. Uh, however, red is then the rarest color. It was the most expensive new and it do look good in red. So let me know in the comments below what color is your favorite. And if you're driving along the road and you're being a little bit blinded by the badly adjusted headlights of another car, all too frequently, you'll find it's a Tesla, unfortunately. However, that is all changing. As we film this, we've just been having the rollouts to activate the matrix headlights. See, from new, this in here is actually a matrix headlight, but it was just non-functional. It's just a flat beam, but with this kind of L-shaped pattern, which would then be really high on one side and blind oncoming drivers all too easily. However, now we have a free standard software update Active uh, high beam is now included with the cars, all of them, standard long range of performance. So this is now an active matrix headlight, whereas this time last week it wasn't. And that's one of the good things with Tesla is that you do get these software updates and things do improve over time. So having blinding Tesla headlights should now be a thing of the past. Matrix headlights are here and they're very good. So the headlights have been fixed, but the rain sensor now, this is one thing which has been frustrating because the rain sensors on a Tesla Model 3 or Y have not been very good. They tend to wipe when they don't need to wipe and don't wipe when they should be wiping. Again, removing the uh, part, uh, rain sensors as Tesla have done and they use the Tesla Vision to activate it just hasn't been much of a thing. It's been like that for a couple of years now. However, we are promised in a very forthcoming software update some good modifications, so hopefully they work nicely from then onwards. But poor rain sensors so far has been, uh, again, one of the bugbears of the Tesla Model Y. However, it's good that we should be able to have a fix of that just with some software updates. So fingers crossed that works. The glass roof is standard on a Model Y, uh, but you can get roof bars and uh, they're from the Tesla store. They're not too expensive and you might be able to buy some if you get some referral credits. Now, referral credits is a, is a scheme from Tesla where you get rewarded if you refer your code and friends and family or people you know use that if you've helped them buy a Tesla. My referral code is in the description below if you need one. So if you're buying a Tesla, make sure you click through that link and order from there. But if you then do the same and share it across, you will get points on your Tesla account, which you can redeem for things like roof bars, free charging, uh, dog load liners for the back. There's a whole uh, Tesla shop of clothing and accessories you can buy if you build up your reward points. So it's a nice scheme from Tesla to reward those who have promoted their car. And typically owners are very happy with their Teslas and they will speak to people and then other people will go on to buy them. So uh, my main point here though was that despite the glass roof, you can get the roof bars and the roof bars are very good. And uh, they're very good in that we've actually got them on our Model 3 outside and they've been on there for months because they don't really seem to affect any efficiency. They're not noisy at all. You don't hear them and so they're good. You just got to be aware that with the Model Y being this tall, if you've got a bike going on top of roof bars, you're going to have to lift it up this high. However, the Model Y can have a tow bar. This panel can be removed from the back bumper and a detachable tow bar can be fixed in place, which means you can maybe carry bikes on the back. In fact, Tesla even sell a bike rack from their store. Now, any Model Y can have a tow bar. This just has to be booked into a service center. You pay your money. I think it's about 1,500 pounds, not cheap, but then it can have a tow bar. So if you need a tow bar, but you're looking at cars that don't have it, it can be fitted. Of course, if somebody's previously fitted it, it's a bonus, you will have it. It will possibly add a little bit of value to that car, probably not by the cost of it new. 
And if you're thinking about towing things like bike racks, great, no problem. If you're thinking about towing trailers and caravans and stuff like that, well, look, they're great for it. The gearbox, you know, lack of gearbox, lack of clutch, the effortless torque, they are very, very good at towing. But what you do have to bear in mind that with the weight and the extra drag mainly, is it roughly speaking halves your real world range. So what is the real world range? Well, a standard range model like this, I usually say about 220 miles. I could certainly make it do more than that, 240, 250, with just a bit of careful driving on a nice day. It could be less if you're thundering down the motorway at 90 miles an hour, but allow 220 miles, quite comfortable. And again, the standard range LFP, 100% battery charging, no problem. The long range is capable uh, of more like, I usually say about 270 miles being realistic. Again, I've covered over 300 miles on a charge. I've done less in bad weather driving quicker. But the long range is realistically 270, 280 miles. Now we've done a couple of videos here as demonstration. One is we drove a dual motor long range until it died, so beyond zero. So if you want to know how far a Model Y goes beyond zero, we did it once. That's the only time I've ever run out of electric was when I did it deliberately. And uh, we did that actually probably a couple of years now against when I had my first Model Y. So check out our other videos for that. The other video I did was drive from Edinburgh down to here on the south coast in a dual motor long range. Now that trip there from up in Edinburgh right across the length of England and part of Scotland, the car just needed one single 30 minute charging stop and that's it. So the long range really is incredible. Again, sometimes I say to people kind of two, seven, two, 80 miles of range, you go, oh, I don't know if that's enough. You go, well, that's Edinburgh to here with one half an hour charging stop and you probably need to stop more than that. I did on that trip. So again, check out other videos for that one. And then the Model Y performance, similar to the long range, a little bit less range, bigger wheels, a bit less efficient. But that's the real world numbers, which obviously a bit different to what Tesla quote, but it's better to you know realistically what they can do. But again, psychologically, you've got to get your head around the fact that you can, you can cover three or four hours of driving quite happily with one of these, and then the charging is very quick. And of course, one of the great advantages with Tesla is their supercharging network. It's always expanding. The charging is ready, easily. You don't need payment cards. You literally just turn up at the charging station, plug it in, and it gets charging. It charges you in the background because the car's on your Tesla account. And you've got your bank card details on there. It charges you, charges quickly, and it's simple to use. Other cars can travel, uh, electric cars can travel around the UK actually quite easily as well, but there's nothing quite like just turning up, just plugging in, it just works, and it's that quick and it's that simple. One of the key Tesla advantages. What does it cost to charge? How much does it cost to run? Well, there's a lot of variables here, but let me do some calculations and give you some example. The best thing to do if you've got an electric car and you cover quite a few miles is to go onto a cheap overnight electric car charging tariff. And currently they're typically kind of seven and a half pence per kilowatt hour. So if I take an example like this standard range here and out of its 60 kilowatt hour grows, maybe 55 or usable, you know, 100% to zero. So completely full charge. That's going to cost you about four pounds and 12 pence. Not too bad, is it? I'll come on to supercharging in a minute. But let's say you charge that without having a cheap overnight rate. Well, currently uh, it's about 27 pence per kilowatt hour, but the electricity price is always changing. That's more like about 14 pounds. Again, completely empty to completely full. So if you measure what you do on a weekly basis for your commute or school runs or shopping, whatever you may do, and let's say it adds up to about 220 miles, maybe you put 50 pounds worth of fuel in your car. Well, this would do that for about 14 pounds instead. Let's take the long range example as well now. So out of that gross battery, about 79 kilowatt hours, typically you only really top up, you know, 100, zero to about 100% is gonna be really strong to get over 70, but let's say about 73 kilowatt hours for the sake of doubt. Um, do that at a cheap overnight tariff, and that's gonna cost you about five pounds 40. And again, you're talking really best part of 300 mile range out of that. Now, if you go to a Tesla supercharger, they're more expensive, actually better than most other chargers. So, you know, the likes of Ionity, Instavolt, Osprey can be 70 pence per kilowatt hour, even more 80 pence per kilowatt hour. They're quite expensive. The Tesla ones vary based on location and time of day, but quite typically, I would say an average would be about 39 pence per kilowatt hour. So a car like this, if you're topping up, say, 80% of the supercharger, that's going to be, roughly speaking, uh, about 17 pounds would be about as much as you could spend at a Tesla supercharger to do a charge and top this up. Uh, let's take the long range. So let's say you're driving from Edinburgh to here. 
you're going to do about a 90% top up at the uh, charges there. So that's times that by now. I'm going to be quite generous here in terms of unfavorable towards a Tesla. Um, you're going to spend about £25 on a supercharging top up plus that initial charge back to 100% or 100% you had before. Uh, so, you know, roughly speaking, £40 Edinburgh to the south coast of England, something like that is about your real world uh, charging costs. Of course, prices of electricity are actually falling at the moment and prices will vary. But hopefully if you're kind of new to all this, at least give you some indicative ideas. And there's other cost savings too. At the moment, there's no annual road tax, but there will be an annual road tax introduced uh, in 2025. There's also no London congestion zone charge or other city centre congestion zone charges and there's actually no typical service routine for Tesla. They don't have a every year, every two years, 12, 20,000 mile service routine. There's actually nothing at all with the Tesla and that's not to say you shouldn't maintain it but Tesla are the first to say well look there actually isn't a routine, there's not much to do, we don't have to change oil and filters. It doesn't do any harm to do the odd cabin filter change I guess but it's a huge cabin filter, it doesn't really need regular maintenance and checking the brake fluid every couple of years doesn't do any harm either. It doesn't mean you have to change it but it's worth checking and uh, brake fluid check kits are quite readily available so you can save quite a lot of maintenance even over other electric cars which still have an annual or two biannual service routine where typically they don't cost a great deal but you still have to do it it might still cost a couple hundred pounds with tesla you really have very little maintenance other than tires and wiper blades but what goes wrong very little actually uh, i've had one seat pad sensor on a model y and is that it, Gitz? Can you think of anything else you've had? We've had loads of these now, hundreds probably. Moisture. The what, sorry? Moisture in a back light. Moisture in a back light. Yeah, not that common on these. There's more common than the three, but we have seen one or two with moisture in a back light. The reality is they really are super reliable. Not much goes wrong. Now, I'm going to go off the basis of the Model 3, which shares a lot of the componentry. Um, and the Model 3, like I say, we have one here with over 100,000 miles. It's been superb. The only thing we've had to do on that car really is some suspension bushes, which, to be fair, are only maintenance issues anyway. And we did that at just over 100,000 miles. Uh, and again, not the end of the world, nothing too expensive. So reliability, what goes wrong? Well, in my experience, very, very little. I would go to say that they are by far, and I mean by far, the most reliable make model of car I've ever had here. The Model 3 and Model Y really are another level. Anything else has had a little bit, so are very reliable other cars. But certainly we look at combustion cars, and you look at the number of things that could go wrong with them, or the number of extra expenses to maintain, like clutches and exhausts and DPF filters and turbos and high-pressure fuel pumps and all that kind of stuff. There's loads of it. Uh, any risks associated, even with quite a high mileage Tesla, I think are really minimal. So what about a car maybe as it comes out of warranty? Well, let's talk about warranties. So all the Model Ys are covered for four years or 50,000 miles, whichever is the sooner from the date it was first registered in the UK. So most of the cars are still actually within that time frame. So if I sold this car today, uh, it's coming up, no, it's about a year and a half old, 30,000 miles. Uh, it actually just transfers across to the new keeper and the full Tesla warranty. Now, after 50,000 miles, there's still a warranty on the motors and the battery unit. So that goes until eight years or 100,000 miles on the standard range or 120,000 miles for the long range and performance version. So even a car that's over four years or over 50,000 miles still has the motors and batteries warranted. So it's eight years old. Does it then have a problem after eight years old? Well, I think it's going to be really, really unlikely. Again, we do see cars now out of warranty. There are companies who are now able to even work on battery packs and stuff like that. But again, this, these batteries have been around a while and they're proven to be very, very good. Uh, the batteries in the Model 3s have been very, very good. Very little issues, even with some really high mileage ones. So I wouldn't expect there to be much, but then potentially in many, many years, there could be a repair or maintenance of the battery. Well, that's all possible independently. It doesn't mean the whole battery's got to be taken away. You can still actually replace modules and stuff like that, apparently. I don't know how that's going to work when you go to st structural battery packs. That's another topic for another day. Uh, but at the moment, absolutely fine. Plus, there will be warranties available. There's now extended battery warranties available for the other testers that are approaching the age or they're coming out of warranty. So you can get extended warranty options available. In reality, you'd be really unlucky to have an issue because, as I keep saying, they have just been stupendously reliable. They're really good. Very, very little goes wrong. Of course, time will tell. When we look back at this video in a couple of years' time, will it be different? 
Possibly so. I can't answer for that, but to date they have just been absolutely wonderful for reliability. So hats off to Tesla for that. People cannot criticise them for build quality either because shut lines and panel gaps and paint finish is generally very good as well. So reliability, build quality, all very good. I guess some people would just say it doesn't have the premium feel of a Range Rover or, you know, pretend chromey bits and stuff like that, a Mercedes. Uh, it's a more minimal look, but it does prove to be robust, long-lasting and very reliable. So back to topic, as a, as a buyer's guide, buying a used one, what should you look out for? Well, really, it's going to be about the cosmetics because there's, at least as we speak at the moment, I can't say check this, check that, maybe check this works and such like because... We just don't encounter the issues with it. It is about just giving the car a good inspection, look and see if the paint's original, it's had repairs done on it. Uh, try and get underneath and have a look that the battery doesn't have any indentations or scrape marks on it. It'd be unlikely because they're very tough and durable. You can slide, no, I'm not gonna say what you can do with it, but they're very tough. You'd, you'd be uh, very unusual to have any uh, impact damage on the battery. Um, but just have a good look around it, check for the condition is the main thing because there isn't really too many other things to look out for. Certainly not as we speak at the moment. I mean, with the uh, S and the X, there are a few more things. You might, on the S, the eyebrows, so the data on rain lights foul, but they're fine on this. Uh, there just isn't that much to go wrong. It's brilliant. And repair costs, by the way, are really cheap. I remember some would have seen the video from a while ago when my neighbor drove into my Model Y when I just had it. It was brand new. It was like a week old. And they damaged this front bumper here. Well, there's another video about me repairing that. But this whole front bumper, 300 pounds. Simple. Simple as that, and the part came quickly and it was easy to fit and change. So to maintain these, even to repair them, is actually very cheap and easy as well. Um, it's why like, insurance shouldn't be expensive on these. And I don't think you are. Again, we did another video about insurance. I'm sure someone's going to mention that. And actually what we did there was try and compare slightly like for like performance cars. You take a Model Y performance. Well, look, let's compare the insurance cost of that compared to a, a BMW X340 M Sport. And they were quite similar. If you're coming from uh, Ford Focus to one of these and your insurance probably is going to be more expensive because they do sit in a higher category, it's a faster car and it's probably a more expensive car. But it would be good to see generally insurance costs come down. A lot of people criticise Tesla insurance, but actually insurance has gone up lots anyway. Uh, so checking your insurance before you buy is probably worthwhile just to check that it's at a reasonable price. But other than that... The Tesla Model Y is just a fantastic car. It really is. It's super practical. It's really functional. It's efficient to run. It's super reliable. And it is cheap to repair should anything happen. So there's not too much I can say. There's not too much to look out for other than the general condition of the car and make sure it's a good one. So I hope that's useful to you. Good luck from buying one. Of course, check out our website if you're looking to buy a Model Y, rscv.co.uk. Owners, if you've got one, let me know your thoughts down below. Any issues you did have, things that people maybe should be aware of. I don't hear of too many things, but if you've had something, let us know. Uh, and of course, if you've been very pleased with your Model Y, it's been trouble three. Take the time just to make a quick comment down below as well, so we get a perspective from both sides. But that's it from me for now. Thank you for watching, and hopefully we'll see another video very soon, because you're going to make sure you're subscribed, aren't you? A lot of our viewers aren't, so hit subscribe, hit the notification, uh, the bell icon for notifications of new videos, and then we'll see you another one very soon. Thank you for watching.